Hi, I'm Dan. I'm from the Netherlands, where we have more bikes than cars. And my <laughs> question about uh, is for Eva. Do you see you take a lot of parking and driving space away? Do you see any sort of secondary effects on on car use? Do people use more public transportation or bikes or walks? Or is there any shifting behavior from people that used to occupy these spaces? Yeah, I mean, I think. If, if you're from there, you know that if you provide really good <laughs> um, offer to bicycle, and that it becomes like Copenhagen and Holland, um, I think if you ask people why they bicycle, it's not because they choose to, it's just the easiest, simplest way to get around. So of course that's a major shift in not driving, because it is simpler to, to take another choice, if that was your question. Not really, I can see it, I know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, there are tons of statistics. I made a promise not to take too many percentage things, but um, in, in the case of New York, which I think is, they are not a biking culture at all. Um, when we started, it was like 0.5% that biked, and afterwards it was one, and it's like, that's nothing, but it's double, right? So it's a start, but what was incredibly, um, unusual, I think, is that when you looked over the whole city and over a few years more, that it was about a 2.5 or 2.4 percent decrease in traffic, even though the city had grown. And that that doesn't happen in city; that it actually decreases. Usually, everything, you know, if you're lucky, it's not like this. It's mm. more balanced. Thank you, Eva. Do we have more questions? We have one in the back. Yes. Hey, um, my name is Felix. I work here in Malmö, actually, uh, at Above, a design agency. And my question is, I think both of you, thank, thanks, first of all, for, for two great talks. I think both of you did a good job of showing how, how we can kind of win by focusing more on the people rather than kind of, I guess, averages of people. Um, and I think as individuals, it's easy for us to relate to that because that's what we do on a daily basis. But then when we build departments and uh, companies, we usually, yeah, we kind of tend to forget about that, right? So how do you get the Department of Transportation to care about uh, grandmothers rather than cars, I guess, is the question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Jeanette Sarikan, who was a commissioner at that time, she described she, her department was like 3,000 people pretty big, most of them were only concerned about keeping it running, like light poles breaking down, fixing things. So the, the idea of changing things seems like that's way beyond. We're just about managing you know, it okay now. So she, she described it as a, like a tanker. She said that it's, it's really it's so hard to change direction, but if we just like start a little bit, everything will slowly change. You can't stop that motion. That was her description of her organization. I know too little of it, so mm. probably some other people know more. I'd, I'd also like to comment on it because I, I as I said, I've been living in the world of user-centered design and if you just know your user, you can do a design for them and you can sort of average over the user group and then you know. And doing SOMA design, I realized that no, actually we're so different. We, are, we have so different experiences. I didn't even know this until I started to do these kinds of bodily exercises and afterwards people reporting back on their experiences and somebody saying like, yay, my one side was huge and dark blue and that movement made me feel this and you go like, what? Dark blue? <laughs> what are you talking about? And so I think there is fundamentally something wrong when we do this assumption that we can know, as a designer, that I can know. I think we have to engage deeply uh, ourselves, of course, with our first person perspectives, but also the whole department and also the three year old bicycling around, seeing the world completely differently. Mm. I mean, I think that when, when you describe SOMA like using your own body experience also as part of the design, it totally resonated with the whole fact that we need to show people and give them a real own life experience of a change of a street. Like in New York City, it was a matter of asking people how they experienced it, not what they thought or their fear, but this is the way it felt. 
yeah. point, you know? And, and users are the experts of yeah. that experience. We sometimes use the expression, move to be moved. It's when you're moving that you can feel. So you're moving to be moved. Can I just come in with a brief question? Being both designers, how do, you, how do we design for everyone, considering people with different needs and accessibility? How, how, what are your thoughts on that briefly? I think this is one of our biggest challenges, and I think that what I've realized that I, is that not only are we different, we're also changing. <laughs> and so I've changed. I'm not the same person I used to be. You know, I went through menopause and that changed my outlook on stuff. My body, my movements, my weight, everything changed. And I have a different way of relating now. So the only way I can see is that you work really hard with empathy and that you train yourself really, really hard on understanding other people, not only intellectually, language-wise, but actually physically, emotionally, uh, seeing the other person uh, and yourself. Thank you. I'm going to make another like, little blink for that uh, exhibition. One thing that came out of this urban belonging project when they worked with underrepresented communities in, in, Den in Copenhagen, um, and they were asked to take photographs of different spaces and then rate them. This is for me or this is not for me. And they were so different, like mm -hmm. <laughs> extremely different. But one thing that came out of it was this inclusivity paradox or inclusive paradox that someone said um, that spaces for everyone is really not spaces for anyone. Mm. And that one thing that seemed to be kind of the same for many of these different groups was that they um, felt uh, that places were for them if they were like really um, invited, but that also meant excluding others, right? So they talked about those for me places being really full of soul and character and strong identity and strong, I would say, an invitation to someone, maybe not all, but to many could be. Um, and I think that the answer in one way is just diversity. Hmm. So if we can multiply all, you know, if the city can be as much as everyone living in it, if it could be as many things and then connected. So multiply everything with diversity, we might have a chance to at least get it kind of right. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Audience, yes, we have a question in the middle. The microphone is coming. Hi, my name is Andres. I'm a communicator at our region's um, tr official trade and investment promotion agency. Um, I have a bit of a question, which is more like a, a provocative thought, so I'm trying to formulate it in a good way. Um, one might say that uh, our overuse and dependence on technology is the reason that we need mindfulness training and breeding training. Um, and yet some of the examples that you showed is providing more tech um, to allow us to be able to pursue mindfulness or, or breathing and relaxation. So yeah. for me, it feels a little bit counterintuitive mm. or contradictory. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. No, so I, I sometimes get this question and I, I think it's super important to remember that we're not going to remove tech so easily. So if you look at kids, for example, you might worry about them sitting too much in front of a computer game all day. Um, can you remove computer games from our culture? Probably not. <laughs> but what you can do is better design. So that's how I see my task. And then, of course, your body is always there for you. If you want to do deep breathing or uh, roll about on the floor and, and whatnot, then you can without technology. Technology can just be a, like a crutch on the way towards uh, a deeper understanding. And so that's how I see it. If we don't explore this, we don't know how to do better design. And if we don't do better design, then we're stuck with language-oriented, visual communication that makes us stuck in our frontal lobe way too much. And we can't have that anymore. And I think we have time for one last question before we need to summarize. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> and after this, of course, you guys can mingle and ask more questions. Okay, hello, my name is Awa and I work for Innovation Skåne. Uh, I have a, a 
a question that I have to ask before I leave, and that is, what happened to the project with IKEA? <laughs> I don't think I was the only one wondering. So I don't know if anyone from IKEA is here today, but actually they are thinking of making the breathing light into a product. So the mat, which is lovely, you should, whenever you come by Stockholm, come and see me and you can try it, it's still working. It is amazing, oh, yeah, but those week. heat elements are uh, not a secure technology. <laughs> 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 Always, and so I think uh, IKEA was like, "Whoa, no, we're not doing that one." But the breathing light, yeah, they're thinking of doing, uh, and and of course you can develop that infinitely. We just did this very simple following of the breathing, but you can have all sorts of breathing. I've learned so many ways of breathing throughout that work that I've, I didn't even know I was capable of. Do you, for example, know that one lung is bigger than the other? because the heart is on this side. Can you feel it? Can, if you breathe, if you take a deep breath, can you feel that one is bigger than the other? I've learned how to do that. And if you guys want to know how to do it, make sure to grab Pia outside. <laughs> and talks of well-being will continue at 4.15 at this session called, What is a Good Life? It will take place in Ant Hill, where we'll meet Carolyn Steele, author of Stopia, Cytopia, Cit Cit and Hungry City. I gi let's give a big warm applause of, uh, to Eva and Pia. Thank you very much. <laughs>